This is Duke University. I have the great honor of introducing these two extraordinary, prolific, insightful, in-demand scholars. To get both of them at one table uh, is something that would be considered, if not a mojiza, not a miracle, then one of the karamat, the wondrous deeds of, uh, of the divine erupting. So I'm going to introduce them in the order that uh, they appear. Uh, Professor Jamila Karim, uh, an extraordinary award-winning author, uh, a dookie through and through, uh, one of the very few people that can match me for the longevity of time that uh, I got to spend at Duke, uh, undergrad all the way through PhD. Um, but she is not only far, far more fashionable, uh, she can genuinely claim to be interdisciplinary because I ended up doing the boring thing of doing a religion major and then a religion PhD. Um, this extraordinary intellectual leader and activist ended up doing electrical engineering. Is that right, Marshall? Um, uh, and then, you know, just to sort of prove that uh, she's got the chops, ended up doing a PhD in humanities. So uh, she specializes in race, gender, and Islam in America. And most recently, she was an associate professor in religious studies at Spelman College. And most of you, of course, <coughs> I imagine, are familiar with the distinguished legacy of, of Spelman. Uh, she taught there for six years. But there are a number of books that you can associate with her, as well as a wide range of articles. The Women of Nation Between Black Protest and Sunni Islam uh, is, is one of them. Um, she was featured recently in, uh, and acknowledged by Jet Magazine. And um, uh, so really someone that we are so deeply, deeply honored uh, to welcome back to do. And we hope that, inshallah, you will continue to <coughs> come back and share the fruits of your, your labor. Um, Edward Curtis is one of those extraordinary figures in the field of Islamic studies, American religion, African American studies. Uh, he's currently the Millennium Chair of Liberal Arts and Professor of Religious Studies at IUPUI. Uh, I had the unenviable task of trying and failing uh, to fill the shoes of Professor Curtis at my former institution, the University of North Carolina, and talk about um, an extraordinary um, weight to sort of walk into classrooms where previously someone of his intelligence, range, and charisma had been teaching for a number of years. Um, he's the author or editor of eight books, including one that I mentioned we'll hear at some point about today, The Call of Bilal, Islam in the African Diaspora, uh, a book that this semester, some of my dear students that I see here are gonna be reading, uh, Muslims in America, A Short History, um, so really, lunch should be on him, because every year I sign his books, and the royalties check should, you know, I think I should get something back, a I'll kickback, a percentage. I'll send you 10%. There we go. There we go. Uh, all um, $10. Yes. Uh, and Professor Curtis has been awarded the Carnegie, the Fulbright, the NEH, and the Mellon Fellowships. So he's a dangerous intellectual, uh, and both Jamila and uh, Edward, Professors Curtis and Karim, represent what, in my estimation, is really the best of organic public intellectual scholarship that is deeply grounded and rooted in meticulous research as well. Uh, please join me in welcoming our two esteemed guests. And today, the format is going to be a conversation between these two. And I'm going to be sitting right with you and taking notes of learning. So please join me in thanking them. So thank you, Omid, for that gracious, sweet, and kind introduction. Uh, such a blessing to be here. Thank you all for coming to hear our conversation. So Can you I, hear us, by the way? OK, so I was, I was still a graduate student at Duke when Prof Professor Curtis came to UNC. And uh, I was interested to know what brought him to the study of Islam and uh, African American, well, African American studies. So I, I like to ask you that for this audience. Well, um, I, I'm a member of a uh, intellectual order called the Hodgsonia, um, 
which is a joke among Islamic studies scholars because many people believe that the greatest introduction uh, to Islamic religion and civilization ever written was a book called The Venture of Islam, which has been taught at Duke, and I don't know if it continues to be taught at Duke. Graduate level. Graduate level. It used to be taught in baby Islam, I think, uh, here at Duke. <laughs> and um, which is what Bruce Lawrence referred to it as, and um, so uh, and I encountered that book when I was 18 years old, and that set me on a path uh, towards uh, towards uh, an interest in Islam. And frankly, for um, I found myself um, deeply attracted to um, the question of why so many African American people had become Muslim. Um, from, um, from, from a very early age growing up in Southern Illinois, the African American experience was the Rosetta Stone through which I saw my own experience as a brown boy growing up in a white supremacist rural environment. And, uh, and so eventually, when I got to graduate school, I decided to, to, to combine these two passions and study the practice of Islam among black Americans, and I was uh, and I was introduced to that topic by attending uh, Friday prayers uh, at the, uh, uh, every Friday at the community that Jamila Kareem's family has contributed so much to, the W.D. Muhammad community. Uh, and, and, and from that, from then on, uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a fantastic intellectual uh, journey. Um, but that's, that's how I, I, so so many times these, uh, these intellectual journeys also mirror our own personal desires and goals and uh, hopes, and that's exactly what happened to me. And you, how did you decide to be a scholar rather than ra rather than an just engineer. a practitioner or an engineer? Okay. Or, yeah. Well, you know, part of it had to do with Omid. I took a course on an intro to Islam course right here. He was a graduate student teaching it, and uh, he taught it beautifully. I learned uh, about Rumi the first time. I learned Rumi's poetry there. And uh, I thought, you know, I could do what he's doing. <laughs> and uh, of course, I, <laughs> I wanted to do it with my, coming from uh, my background and my passion, which was the, ex the African American Muslim experience. And that experience for me and my family was through the Nation of Islam, uh, originally. When I was growing up, my mother would tell us a story, me and my siblings, a story about how when she was young, after playing in the hot sun for hours, she would then sit in the bathtub for hours, literally trying to wash her suntan away. And my mother would share this story, one, to really um, convey to us the deep psychological impact of racism, but also to convey to us the gift of Islam. Because really, for her, Islam, it healed the wounds of racism. And particularly because of uh, the message of Islam that she was given through the nation. And so the nation of Islam was very liberating for her because it was the first time that she heard this liberating narrative of blackness. And so because of her and other stories like that that I heard growing up in a community with roots in the nation, I was born uh, in 1976, so after Imam Muhammad had made that transition, so I was never in the Nation of Islam. But of course, I inherited that uh, tradition through the stories like my mother's. And so I always saw Islam as a liberating faith. So when I was in academic context, and particularly the study of religion context, and, and heard about the ways in which um, black religion, for instance, was uh, con considered a liberation, or, or some parts that were considered, considered liberation theology, you know, that made sense to me, and I thought uh, it resonated with my, my um, passion and my history. And so I thought that um, this was the perfect opportunity then to bring um, that ex my experience, um, my love for Islam, this, this, again, this idea that Islam is a social movement that can elevate and transform people, and then to bring that into the academic arena and to study it in that way. So that's how I'm here. So, so let me ask you another question. Okay, so why is it important to integrate the study of black history and Islam? Yeah, so it, the, 
the reason why we have to, I think, integrate black history and Islam is, is partly um, what you just shared about your own story, is that I see um, reading Islam as black history as, a one, as one way to challenge the white supremacy still regnant in the humanities. If you think about the way that we teach comparative religion, philosophy, um, and classics, black Africa continues to be meaningless for most students of those fields. It's simply Hegel, um, Hegel's view that Africans are a people without history, a people without consciousness, a people without objective knowledge, it still rules the way that we understand uh, that we understand humanity in comparative religion, philosophy, and classics. Black Africa apparently has nothing to, act, to offer, you know, uh, philosophers who insist on, on weaving their tradition from ancient Greece to the analytic tradition of Anglo-America and the continental philosophers in France and Germany. I think that's uh, plain wrong. I think it ignores the deep uh, record of learning um, and art and music and all of the ways of being human that Africans um, have offered the world. And one of the ways, one of the things that has to be included uh, in studying what it means to be human um, from a black perspective, it has to include the Islamic, uh, Islamic texts, Islamic architecture, Islamic art, because these have been interwoven now for more than a thousand years. There, and there's no way to separate them out. There's no way to separate Islam from the African experience and the African diaspora experience. And there's, there's no way to separate Islam or, but either, or, and vice versa. These two things are intertwined like the strands of DNA. So that's why I think it's so vital. It's not simply because, yes, it happened. It's because we cannot be human. We cannot confront white supremacy unless we are ready to account for the incredible, rich uh, human traditions of people who happen to be black. And, is, and, and looking at this through an Islamic lens is one way to account for that and include it in our notion of who we are as human beings and who we have been. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. And I would add to that, if you think about it, there was a time in this country where the only Muslims here, the only Muslims here were West Africans, and for nearly 400 years. And so, uh, as you know, that many of the, uh, the the Africans, the enslaved Africans, were Muslim. So there, right there, the study of Islam in America, it pushes us to to look at uh, West Africa, and so and then so that's one piece, the, the Africa piece. But then. Um, I wanted to also think about the modern civil rights movement piece. And that's why I chose this picture here. But I think that integrating the study of Islam and black history does is that it, it disrupts the narratives that polarize the civil rights movement and the nation of Islam. Uh, usually, uh, historians, you know, academics, they talk about uh, the civil rights movement in terms of its nonviolent strategy, and it talks about the nation of Islam in terms of uh, self-defense as its approach. However, uh, many historians are looking at the ways in which uh, civil rights activists, for instance, they actually incorporated both nonviolent and self-defense strategies, or that uh, while there were, uh, for instance, SNCC protesters who were nonviolent in strategy that actually in their communities, uh, there were people who were, they were, they were actually armed and prepared to defend them if necessary. And a one a white SNCC, woman SNCC activist, also a historian now, she, she thought about it and said, you know, actually the violence at that time could have been 10 times worse if not for the fact that there were these members of, of the community who were prepared. So, um, so again, it's a, it's a way of weaving together these, con these concepts that have been uh, opposed. And so what's really interesting about this picture is that, is that Rosa Parks is usually, so she is the icon of the civil rights movement, the woman icon. 
And so here she's looking admirably, admirably at uh, Malcolm X. So it's a nice um, juxtaposition of those two, those two movements, but also uh, recent biographies and studies of Rosa Parks of women uh, in the civil rights movement have shown that indeed uh, Rosa Parks uh, she did advocate for self-defense, and that she found uh, Ma Malcolm X a personal hero. That she loved, of course, and admired Dr. King, but uh, there were many um, stances that Malcolm X took early on, particularly his opposition to the Vietnam War, that aligned with her views. So I just, again, I just, I love the way that these uh, new histories are, again, disrupting these conventional narratives. Well, I, I want to ask you about that because if if black people have been left out of the record of what it means to be human, mm -hmm. right, then, then, then clearly women, um, uh, gay and lesbian and transgender people have also been left out of that record. And I'm wondering how you think right. that the study of gendered identity, uh, sexual identity, challenges both Islamic and black history by including right. By including Rosa Parks' embodied presence there, mm. you know, looking at Malcolm, who's, I think, sometimes unfairly uh, just very superficially painted as an outright sexist when he was a complicated, evolving kind of person. But exactly. how do you think? How do you think that 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 taking that gendered look at both Islam and Black history sort of changes the what we yeah. see? Yeah, it it changes it dramatically. And I'm gonna again start with the civil rights movement because I think it's so important and there's so much of that history that, uh, that shapes obviously who we are today but we don't know enough about. And so Rosa Parks is a perfect example again that uh, when we leave, not, it's not even just about gender, it's even just leaving women out of the story we are omitting so much of the story, right? And, and, the, and the complexity of these women's lives, or just these individual lives who contributed so much to the movement. And so, so the dominant narrative of the civil rights movement is that you know, the men were up front as leaders and the women were on the periphery. But certainly uh, there are a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of studies that are uh, disproving this and showing that women were in fact the backbone of the civil rights movement of SNCC, for instance. And so uh, one of the things that we want to do, too, is leave you with some uh, books, some uh, online sites, so that you can take what we've uh, shared here and incorporate it. So um, one, thing, one YouTube video that I found perfect for this discussion is called The Art of Activism, Women's Civil Rights Leaders Tell Their Stories. And watching this video, I learned about a book that I had not known about, and it's a book titled Hands on the Freedom Plow, Personal Accounts by Women in SNCC. And SNCC is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And it was released in 2010. And this book was unprecedented and groundbreaking because it tells the stories of 52 women in the movement in their own voices, on their own terms. And so, uh, Another book, I'm going to come back to this, to the Hands on the Freedom Plow, but another book that came out before it was uh, Freedom's Daughters, the Unsung Heroines of the Civil Rights Movement, written by a journalist. And so uh, it also does a lot to, to change the narrative. So for instance, I mean, many of us know now that, uh, well, first I would say many, the popular narrative is that you know, Dr. King, he led the Montgomery boycott, and, or that um, it was initiated by Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat, right, so on the bus. So I think by now, probably because of books like Freedom's Daughters, we know that Rosa Parks was not the first woman to refuse her seat. But even more than that, from Freedom's Daughters, for instance, we learned that black women in Montgomery, they were organizing as early as 1946 against abuses of, against blacks uh, in the city, including the abuses that occurred on buses. And so again, this means that women were preparing the soil long before, uh, it, long before 1955, which led to the boycott, which led to the prominence of Dr. King. So that's just one example of the ways that women 
have been um, leaders in, in the background, but also in the forefront. So, uh, so going back to the Hands on the Freaking Plow and this video, the YouTube video, where there were a panel of the editors of this book, and they were, uh, they were asked, you know, if you could select one of the narratives that, um, if th we had this opportunity to have one of those narratives to be a permanent part of the K through 12 curriculum, which one would you pick, right? And so it was very hard for the women. One of the women, they told that they would pick the narrative Diane Nash. And many of you familiar with Diane Nash, if not um, through books you've read, but through Selma. So that was, and I, and I love that movie in the sense that it was, again, trying to, to rewrite these narratives. And one of them was, one way to do that was the, in, in highlighting Diane Nash. So anyway, in this uh, book, <coughs> It, they tell the story of her decision to go to jail even when she was pregnant. She was pregnant with her first child. And this is what Nash wrote about her decision. She said, this will be a black baby born in Mississippi. And thus, wherever he is born, he will be in prison. If I go to jail now, it may hasten the day when my child and all children will be free. Wow. And, and then the woman moderating the story, Deborah Schultz, she said, and that's the kind of leadership that we need to know about. And I, I actually thought of my recent work, Women of the Nation of Islam, and I, uh, Women of the Nation, and I highlight, uh, I talk about Imam Wardi Muhammad, and he talked about we, us needing this mother leadership that, uh, but you know, there is something about the experience of being a mother that we uh, can contribute to the society in ways that men just cannot, right? So that, it reminded me of that, but also just listening to the women who brought the, the editors of the, of the Freedom Plow, uh, or Hands on the Plow, Hands on the Freedom Plow, um, it, it was profoundly touching to hear the stories like that of Diane Nash. And it was, but also it was intellectually stimulating for me because it was, a moment when I fully comprehended the significance of my work and well, a particular interview that I conducted. And this interview was with Anna Kareem. And so please excuse me for taking so long on this question. I think it's so important. But I'm turning to you too, though, because I discovered Anna Kareem through your book, Black Religion. Black Muslim Religion. Thank you, Black Muslim Religion. And I was beginning to think about ways to write women of the nation, because no one had at that time, no one had devoted a whole book on women's experiences, but Professor Curtis had already done an excellent job of looking at women's experiences through their own, their own lens, and it's in a section of his book. And there, he described Anna Kareem as a former SNCC activist turned NOI member. And I was like, wow, I need to find out who this is. And I contacted you. You didn't know who she was. I contacted Ka Kathleen Cleaver. I just happened to know I had a contact for her. She was like, there were so many who came through SNCC. There's no way. So I gave up on it. About a year later, I interviewed Aisha Mustafa, the editor of the Muslim Journal with the Imam Warfi Muhammad community. And uh, she was telling me about Imam Muhammad's contribution and that he uh, appointed the first female editor of the Muhammad Speaks newspaper, and her name was Anna Kareem. <laughs> like, wow, Anna Kareem, is she still alive? Oh, yes, she is. Contact Susan Zubeda at the paper. She'll give you her number. I called Susan Zubeda, and I spoke with Anna Kareem. And it was, um, it was moving to me. I was elated because as she's telling me these, this, her story. I'm going to share a little bit of her story. I thought, like, this was amazing that I had found a treasure. But now I realize that I was part of a larger movement. Hands on the Freedom Plow was published in 2010. These women were working on this for 15 years. But I realized that here in my study of Islam and the nation of Islam and rewriting that history or incorporating women's voices, I was doing the same work, that the, this groundbreaking work that these women were doing and not knowing it. So this history, again, revisiting the larger black history, the civil rights history, it further amplified the significance of my work. And, and so that was just very exciting for me. And uh, even one of the women, uh, the, women the women editors said that one story wasn't enough. 
that just one view wasn't enough. So even just that one extra story, even Anna Kareem's story, we, it, it, it's important and valuable when we need to know. So I'm just going to share, and I'll, I'll end with this, uh, my writing about her story for a blog that I did. So you know, I, I try to blog because I know that people, some people won't read my books. I know all of you will, but for those who don't. Um, so here's some of her story. So Anna was no ordinary woman in the nation, or person for that matter. She was invited by Elijah Muhammad personally to join the organization. A SNCC activist carrying out voter registration work in poor rural areas near Tuskegee Institute, where she attended college, Anna witnessed grave atrocities against African Americans. I nearly lost my life, Anna told me, her words bearing no exaggeration. Some of her peers were shot to death fighting for the rights of others. News of these courageous students made local newspapers that eventually fell into the hands of Elijah Muhammad. Upon his invitation, she sat with Muhammad who tried to convince her to join the Muslims. She initially declined returned to Tuskegee in her SNCC work and witnessed one of the most horrific acts of inhumanity perpetrated against a pregnant African-American woman. Elijah Muhammad's call began to make sense and so she reconsidered his invitation. She continued, so I thank God that he gave me the patience to try to sit down and listen to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Somehow, Instinctively, I felt that maybe he could take me to a higher level that I would not have, have to run in fear of my life all the time while trying to help people who were in worse shape than I was. Never been to a college campus, their children almost illiterate because all of them were being used to work those plantations. So that was the beginning. That was a kind of long answer, my dear, but that was the beginning of my decision to leave. I felt I would not live much longer. It's not that I feared death, but there was so much I wanted to do. I didn't want to die not having accomplished anything. Just die on a back road in some rural county and my body be buried in a cornfield or drowned somewhere in a stream. I didn't want to die like that, so I left because I thought there was a higher mission, a better opportunity to help my people with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And, and lastly, I think it's a nice parallel with Rosa Parks and Dr. King, and, and, and all of us, in, in that there's this evolution of thought, right? So going back to the point about you know, these dichotomies between self-violence, uh, I'm not sorry, non-violence and self-defense, you know, maybe there are moments when you have to choose one strategy over the other, or there's an evolution in how you're thinking about um, these strategies. So Anna Kareem and her moving to the Nation of Islam, like your moment, represents that kind of nuance. So. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Very no, thank you. I mean, it's, a, uh, it's really wonderful to weave that story into our larger sense of what the civil rights movement was and Muslim contributions to it. Since, as you point out, oftentimes Muslims are seen as a foil to the to Martin Luther King Jr.'s, uh, you know, Christian-led civil rights movement. That just wasn't the case on the ground. It was far more dynamic, as, yeah. you're, as you're pointing out. Um, so I wonder, should we go back to, um, so you're talking about women sort of in the last 50 years, okay? Mm -hmm. But what about, I mean, is it possible, I mean, do women matter before the 1960s in, yeah, <laughs> in black Islam? I mean, can you, how far back can you go to identify women who matter, black women who matter to the history of Islam? Yes, it's great. You know what, well, it also depends on how you define Islam. For and instance, black. and black, right? For instance, uh, my son the other day said, Joseph is a Muslim name. And I said, well, yeah, that's right. If you are thinking about the way that he is thinking about it in terms of the prophets in the Quran. So, uh, and, and so, of course, we share that, that prophetic legacy. We share those narratives with uh, Judaism, with Christianity. So in that sense, you know, many of the prophets were black. There are so many prophets too that we don't even know about that are not even mentioned in the Quran. So certainly many of them come from the continent of Africa. I mean, just the scientific evidence that we have that the, the first human fossils were found in Africa, we could then surmise that uh, the um, that Adam 
was a black man. Again, with, with the, the limited scientific information that we have, we can make that kind of, we can come to that kind of conclusion. But certainly talking about women, there's Hagar, who uh, spans all of these traditions again, who was a wife of uh, Abraham. And I don't know if you're not familiar with the story, but just quickly, from the Islamic tradition, uh, he married Hagar. So Hagar is, a, is an Egyptian woman. She's a black woman. So he marries her, Abraham. He's already married to Sarah. So we understand that God told him, or he takes uh, Hagar to the wilderness, which will become Mecca takes her there, and first she protests, why are you leaving me here? Why are you leaving me here? So she asked many times, and then finally, I guess he didn't answer, and then finally she said, did God tell you to do this? And he said, yes. And then at that point she submitted. But she, submit, she submitted to that, um, you know, her destiny in a sense, but she still struggled. What she did, she had her baby with her, Ishmael. The baby began to cry, she ran out of milk. What she did was she ran between these two mountains, Safa and Marwa, looking for milk. And in that, I mean water, or looking for people, right, looking for water people. And so uh, she found no one, but then the, the, a well appears at her, at the foot of Ishmael. And this is the well of Zamzam. So what's amazing is that a whole nation is, comes about, is produced because of the efforts of Hagar. Right, because now there's water, now there are people who are attracted to this area, this uncivilized spot now becomes civilized. And then um, Abraham comes back, they build the Kaaba there. And so all of these, the three traditions I mentioned, celebrate Hagar, but it's a unique way that Muslims celebrate her through the Hajj. That any, mo any Muslim going to Mecca, Hajj season or off Hajj season, the first thing that she must do is that you must circumambulate the Kaaba, and then you must walk in the footsteps of Hagar. You walk, and at a point you run between those, those hills. So uh, it's just amazing that a black woman is the foundation of this, this, um, this city. And her efforts, her, you know, her faith, her reliance on God is what produces this space, and that we walk in her footsteps and commemorate her. So that's one way. Tell us more about um, Oh, let me add one more. Another yeah. one is the Queen of Sheba. Yeah. Right. We just studied this, my kids and I, because I homeschooled them, and I thought it was really important that we start Are with, there good children's books on the Queen of Sheba? There, there actually are. So Forget, I can't we'll have a parental okay. moment here. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we both have there younger children. There actually are. Okay, you got to send, and you gotta send those to me. Okay, okay absolutely. And yeah. what's important <laughs> are the illustrations that you want black people. And a lot of the books on uh, ancient Egypt are, are and so, uh, but she's from, so she's from this, so many say that she's from Yemen, some say she's from Yemen, and some say <coughs> that she is from Ethiopia. And at that time, at the time of the Queen of Sheba, if I'm right, Ethiopia was called Aksum. And so, but the neat thing about Aksum was that it was a civil, a kingdom that did cross the Red Sea into Yemen. So that's why it can be contested, you know, that she could be from Yemen or Ethiopia. Like they, sh those two spots, they shared queens and kings, and, and so hence, you know, that's why we have those possibilities. So the Queen of Sheba was a black woman, and uh, her narrative is in the Quran. Well, yeah. it, it, I mean, it's, and the you point out so nicely that the geography of the Hejaz, the western part of Arabia, uh, is incredibly close to what we call the African. And really, at the time, it's part of a, uh, you know, it's part of a whole cultural system of exchange. You cannot separate Western Arabia <laughs> from Africa. It's part of that world. And so, I mean, really, for the very, um, if we sort of anachronistically put our sense of what it means to be black, we use that lens to look back at, uh, you know, the, the, the time of the prophet, then you know there there are a bunch of black people running around, and of course the prophet himself is said to have some black roots, right? I mean through one of his genealogies, and so uh, and so there's no there's no way to tell the history of Islam from the very beginning, um, not just sort of in a primordial mythological sense, but also in the sort of historical historical sense, right? Um, um, without telling the story of African descended people and, and black people. And, and so in addition to some of his companions, especially Bilal ibn Rabah, 
who's the son of uh, an Abyssinian woman, right? Uh, in addition to Bilal, um, from the very, from his age on, I mean, from what the, there are some Muslims who go to Abyssinia in exile, for example, right? They go to, they go to what today is, right, to Ethiopia. And, and then, and then, of course, by 641, a Muslim army has conquered Egypt. And so these are very early, you know, times. But then it takes hundreds of years, and I think it's really important, a lot, so, one of, the, one of the things at stake in understanding the Islamic presence in Africa is the idea that it is a foreign tradition to Africa. Mm -hmm. So Chancellor Williams wrote a book called The Destruction of Black Civilization, around 1972, don't, right around there. And Stokely Carmichael also uh, argued that Islam was a foreign element inside of, uh, this is the Black Panther Party uh, uh, leader, Stokely Carmichael, inside of, um, inside of Africa, but it's so important. It took over five centuries for the majority just of North Africans to become Muslim. This is not, I mean, the conquest was one thing, military control. The idea that the people who were living there, you know, for example, Berbers would actually practice, no, no, it took hundreds of years for, for the majority to become, and it took even longer for people on, in West Africa and East Africa to become Muslim, and they became Muslim by dint of the incredible institutions, you know, that they built, the poetry that they rhymed, um, you know, the Maliki school of fiqh, which they dominated and, and continue to dominate to this day, one of the four main schools of law in Sunni Islam, you know, and so it's really looking at the, looking at these, um, what they left behind for us their heritage. That's where I was coming from in terms of <coughs> we are doing a terrible job in the American Academy at even cataloging and preserving the, manu the beautiful manuscripts that West African Muslims have. I mean, it's, you know, we've had, we have incredible archaeological digs and cataloging of texts in other places, but we have not devoted the money necessary even to catalog the existing texts from West African seminaries, mostly written in Arabic, but also in Fula and Hausa at times. So, um, so if we we still have, if anybody's looking for a dissertation topic, I mean, there's there's still it's still the wild frontier out there. There's still like basic work to be done, that in order to preserve our human heritage, and um, and that's not you know that's not the only thing. I mean, how you how you can teach poetry without looking at Swahili poetry. I don't get it. You know, I just don't understand how, you know, if you're going to take a global view of poetry as, as a human expression, I brought along a couple verses uh, just, to, just to read you. You know, and by the way, we've had volumes of it translated into English since 1971, since Jan Nopper. There's really no excuse not to include this stuff. Uh, you know, just take one example. So, any of you who have been along the east coast of, of Africa, uh, you have to imagine yourself there as, um, as you're seeing the rains come down. And I think Omid recently wrote about rain as Rahma, and indeed, I think in Turkey they talk about rain as Rahma, uh, mercy, right? And, um, and, and so, some of the Swahili poets, classical poets, talked about what the, the way in which rain came down uh, as a, um, not as a, a one-way gift of God. It's not a one-way, you know how, it's just a, no, no, it wasn't. Um, but is rain itself is a product of reciprocity that exists between God and God's creation, human beings. And so we humans have a role. And so here, I'll give you a couple verses in translation. You would think that when the rain descends, that it is water from the coast that gets mixed up, or maybe a big river. But instead, allow that a cloud of prayers goes to the prophet eternally, and then pours down like rain, and another does from our good wishes. And this is the kind of human uh, you know, heritage that is deeply in need uh, of, 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 of being taught uh, in our classrooms and being recited in our public spaces 
you know, to, um, and is not, unfortunately. And, and then, don't get me started about the West African text. Three, at least 300 Arabic fula and Hausa texts from the hands of people like uh, Mohammed Bello, Osman Danfodio, and then 60 texts from Osman Danfodio's daughter, Nana Asma'u. Right? 60 texts. Nana Asma'u should be a household name in America. But she's not. She is not. And so, and, and, and there's no excuse for it. You can't say that her, her right? Just like Sheikh Ibrahim Niyas. Some of the most important writing, perhaps some one of the most important Sufi texts, Omid can argue if he wants later, uh, but uh, you know, one of the most important Sufi texts ever written, right? And then, of course, there's the poetry of Amadou um, Baba, right? The, the Baba, the, uh, the, the, the recited, the, the founder of the Moridi Sufi order, recited by millions of people around the world on a daily basis. We are talking just about a deeply rich heritage that, that, um, that, that should be as close to us as uh, anyone whom we uh, talk about for, as Chaucer, as, you know, uh, uh, or, or, or what have you as part of our normal canon. And so that's my hope, is I think if we can, re if, we, if we in the humanities can, uh, can insist that these, um, th that these kinds of texts are integrated into uh, uh, our philosophical thinking, in, 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 into a reinvigorated field of classics that goes beyond white supremacy. And it, um, if we can do that, we will have, we can turn our activism um, into a deeply humanistic form uh, of, of liberation versus what it is, uh, versus what the humanities are which is, which is uh, basically a Hegelian racial map of white dominance. Mm, right. Yeah, it, it's in, interesting because I really think that it, it is due to white supremacy that uh, we don't, that people don't perceive Islam as a black religion. I mean, certainly, I, I think many black people do, particularly from my parents' generation, even my generation, they understand the role that Islam played in uh, in the black in the black freedom struggle, right? Um, Malcolm X, but um, right, the Nation of Islam. So it's very clear that again, this liberating narrative it contributed to the black freedom struggle in terms of um, educating or um, giving more power or more language for black people to talk about their, their beautiful or their um, royal African heritage, right? So the Nation of Islam contributed in that way. But I think the reason that most people or most white people don't know that Islam is indeed a black religion or certainly a form of black protest religion is because it's for the same reason that we don't know, for instance, the history of Rosa Parks, that we don't know uh, that, in, that Rosa Parks, she moved to Detroit eight months after the, the bus boycott, and that she was an advocate for racial equality for you know, decades after that, um, that we don't know these histories, and because otherwise, if we knew the fullness of the black freedom struggle and civil rights movement, we would also know the role that Islam has in it. So um, I came across this, this piece that was written by Alice Walker in 1967. And she talked about this notion that the black freedom movement or the civil rights movement had ended. And there was a, there's a piece in that that I wanted to share. She says that um, the movement is dead to the white man because it no longer in interests him. And it no longer interests him because he can afford to be uninterested. He does not have to live by it, with it, or for it, as Negroes must. He can take a rest from the news of beatings, killings, and arrests that reach him from north and south if his skin is white. 
Negroes cannot now and will never be able to take a rest from the injustices that plague them, for, the, for they, not the white man, are the target. And I, this was relevant because, again, um, it's this way of, again, not knowing the fullness of this history and not knowing or not wanting to know or acknowledge the ways in which um, the struggle continues. So, you know, again, the reason that we don't know that Islam is a form of black protest religion is, too, the same reason that we imagine that we live in a post-racial society, that we do not recognize the ways in which um, the, the black struggle is still very much alive and the ways in which people appropriate religion, and in this case Islam, to, to, resist, um, to resist racism. And we would know it, or, or if we, just the fact that there is a Million Man March, like why is it that uh, we, we had another Million Man March? What's it called, the Million Man March? There's Million Family the March. The Million Family March, but the most recent one. Yeah. That yes. is the yeah. time. Yes. Right, exactly, there have been two Million Man Marches. So, so obviously there is still this movement going on, of course, in new, in new forms. In my book I talk about how Minister Farrakhan's uh, approach has changed very much. But still, we, when we tend to think about Islam, uh, and especially you know, white people, and many Americans tend to think about immigrants and not African Americans. And I would argue, in addition to just not knowing the history of the black freedom struggle, <laughs> it's that anything that challenges the status quo uh, is something that is going to be targeted. You know, it's, it's happened to many, it's happened to several um, groups. And so now this is a time when Muslims are also among those groups that are being targeted. So for that reason, um, it's, it to, it's, it's important to consider to see Islam as this foreign entity, not to recognize that there are African American Muslims here with a long standing history, even going back to slavery. Because when you recognize that presence, then you no longer can teach this uh, false, this, this lie, really, that Islam is this foreign religion that is a threat to us. Yeah, so. unless you, you say your president is a secret Muslim, for example. <laughs> right? I mean, because, I mean, it's, it's fascinating how, indeed, so I agree that for, for a number of Americans, the reading of Islam as black history um, pr is helpful to preventing uh, the thought that Muslims are quintessential foreigners. Mm -hmm. Those who are willing to say, hey, you know, um, my congressman, Andre Carson, is the second Muslim elected to Congress. My congressman, Keith Ellison, is, is the first Muslim elected to Congress. They are Muslims too, or for that matter, Muhammad Ali, right. you know, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and the list goes on and on, and Ifti Hajj Muhammad, the, uh, the graduate of, of Duke, right? Yeah. The, the, the saber fencer who, uh, who's gonna represent the United States in the Olympics with, a, with her hijab on, the first right. U.S. Olympian to do that. Uh, another Dukey, making good in the world. Huh? Uh, but, but I think that's one thing, but uh, it's quite, um, but, but for certain, but for a percentage of the population, even then, it's not enough. Even coloring Islam black still doesn't challenge the sort of essential foreigner and the stranger. In fact, it becomes even more dangerous because look, they're bringing black people to the religion. It's going to be even more dangerous for us. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. um, so I, I personally, I will use that. That work, that appeal works oftentimes. I was just out in Omaha, met Malcolm X's birthplace, to talk about black Muslim contributions to US culture. And I think for all the people in the audience, that appeal works. But I think that there are many Americans who would just see uh, black Muslims as, as other anti-American radicals. No, even so that, so that, for example, my congressman, Andre Carson, gets accused of, of secretly being influenced by Sharia law or something, you know, on the, he's on, by the way, he sits on the uh, National Security, whatever the National Security Committee is, in the, uh, in the House of Representatives, and that then brought about, you can't have an enemy, because he's hiding his real identity through taqiyya. He really, you know, he really is not, he can't be a loyal American, 
and um, that doesn't that doesn't injure him as a because he's in a a, 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 a district with a large number of African Americans who don't buy that line. But I think it does work for some. Mm -hmm. And so how we, I mean, we have to face the limits, I guess, of, of reading, of, of interpreting Islam as black history as a way then mm -hmm. to, right. to, to, to encourage inclusion, because it too has its limit. And it's only through that direct confrontation, one way or another, with white supremacy. Absolutely. Yeah, That's that we can, I mean, as much as I want to try to explain, hey, Muslims are just like you, non-Muslim. Um, they're still without a direct confrontation with, with white supremacy uh, and Islamophobia. I, I don't know how else. I, I don't know how to how, how to negotiate that. Like it can't be put under the rug in any way. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So, what about the way that Islam is not even it's not perceived as an anti-black religion either? Have you thought about that? That it is perceived as an anti-black religion, or isn't? That it it it, it, it is not either. Yeah. Well, it's so. So Islam is seen as an anti-black religion among some of my colleagues in Africana religions. Okay. Yeah, and so that so so the so that argument that I was mentioning about Stokely Carmichael, you know, the, the and and Chancellor Williams, the idea that Islam is a foreign presence in Africa. So you will still see that, for example, if you attend, like I'm um, a member of the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora, Aswad, which means black in Arabic. Um, and um, uh, and so um, and you will oftentimes find the the um, competing black voices within there, but the dominant one in that are African Americans and some Anglo's who have converted to various Orisha-based religions, who see Islam as somehow threatening uh, of that, and indeed. When Islam is uh, a sort of when Islam is practiced in an exclusivistic form that doesn't allow for you know sort of a multi, uh, first of all religious pluralism, but uh, in Africa, um, when for example Osman Danfodio is cited you know as a man who wanted to very much extinguish many indigenous African beliefs, then you can see where that comes from. Mm -hmm. I mean there is there is no doubt that some Muslim reformers who are black themselves have attempted to eliminate African traditional religious practices in Africa. And anyone who argues that that's never existed is, is being very ideological. We, we, Muslims and Christians need to acknowledge their complicity in uh, harming and trying to reduce the practice of African indigenous religions. But there is an on the other hand which is Muslims and Christians have also, uh, have also incorporated many African indigenous practices, local practices, into their own practices. And for many of the, for example, African descended women, enslaved women who came to the United States and who lived on the Sea Islands in Georgia, who both prayed, who made salat, daily prayer in the Islamic tradition, and sacrificed chickens to take their blood and put it on a wound to heal it, for them there was no contradiction, right? And so, um, so what was playing out uh, even on the Sea Islands in Georgia sometimes still plays out in academic conferences where I honestly have debates where, where some academics are on the side that Islam will, has always been and will always be foreign and it can't possibly be black. And because they read that, because they look at, and my, and my response is yes, you are right about you are right about the Muslim and Christian sort of uh, missionary impulse at times to extinguish indigenous tradition, religious tradition. You are absolutely correct, but it's way more complicated than that because it is generally people from the very same region who are, in the name of their Christian and Muslim reform, extinguishing what they see as pagan or indigenous are otherwise undesirable practices. So if, if we teach about this in the right way, we once again show the complexity and the humanity of black people by saying, you know, it's now, it's, it's complicated because you have these religiously plural environments in which people are competing, sometimes peacefully, sometimes violently, you know, in terms of who's going to, what the rules uh, and the ethical norms by which they're gonna live. 
Well, Sylvia, do you, she's done a lot of work on enslaved Africans, mm -hmm. and, uh, and you talked about the ways in which African women, they brought those traditions. So, uh, so my question really is just, what are some of works like Sylvia and the Youth? So the Sylvia, the, Sylvia and the Youth is the author of Servants of the Law. And there's probably a subtitle, but Servants of the Law. The African is. Muslims Enslaved in the Americas, I right. think. Right, okay. So, so I think she's a great, one great place to start. I agree. Um, that would be my number one place to oh, start. Really? Okay, great. So I was going to yeah. ask, what are, so, and you can either expound upon that or tell me what are some other studies, humanistic studies, that, that or, you know, sources that look at the humanistic study of Islam as black history. Yeah, and so there is a beautiful, hard to, but hard to find 1980s source book by Alan Austin called African Muslims in Antebellum America, which has um, a great deal of primary sources. Um, it's a, it's a, so it's an edited source book. So that's a wonderful, I mean, it's, it's, it's typewritten, um, and, but it's long and rich. And it's a, it's a still very relevant um, sort of, uh, and I'm sure you have a copy uh, here. Um, uh, but, um, but it's like by, from Garland Press, I don't know. Uh, and he later published a little book based on that, which is useful, but don't be confused, they have the same title. So, uh, uh, and, and I think that um, uh, Omar, uh, North Carolinian Omar Ibn Sayyid's autobiography, 1831 in Arabic, is a very important document. And there's a whole book about that document. Um, uh, and uh, a secondary, so a new translation. Um, and so that's, that's one place to go. Um, there is, so there's an increasing amount of research. Um, there's a dissertation that's just been done um, in Florida about Bilali Muhammad, which traces him from West Africa to the Caribbean and then to Georgia. Um, and that's gonna come out as a monograph probably in a year and a half. Um, uh, and, and so be on the lookout for that. What, but in order to really to, to really pay attention to enslaved African Muslims, we have to take the, the hemispheric frame rather than the North American. Because as you know, most African-born uh, people uh, traveled the Middle Passage to the Caribbean and to South America, not to North America. Very few African-born people arrived first in North America, right? A, a, a very small percentage. And so in order to understand um, this story, we have to uh, refigure our gaze and include the Caribbean and South America. So certainly we'd start with uh, Joao um, Jose Hayes, which is spelled R-E-I-S, Portuguese Hayes, R-E-I-S. Um, um, his, uh, his book about the Bahia Revolt in 1835, which is fantastic, the Muslim revolt there. Um, but what's, but I, can, I can follow up. Uh, with people who are interested is we have all kinds of texts uh, in Jamaica, around the Caribbean, Brazil, uh, of people of African descent. And then not too long after, we've got a bunch of Javanese in Suriname, brought by the Dutch, and a ton of both of Indians, um, British Indians, so including Muslims and Hindus, uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, and so really the, the history, that is another place for those of you who are looking for undergraduate or graduate <coughs> topics of research. Um, you don't have much competition if you want to talk about Muslims, uh, the history of Muslims in the Americas by going to the Caribbean and South America. So I, I don't know if that rings true for you. But, um, does that <laughs> Do you think we're sometimes too focused on North America and the U.S. context? Do you feel that's an urge to be more transnational? Or do you think, well, it's, let's focus mostly, because let's focus mostly on the U.S. It's worthwhile doing so. No, I think absolutely. I think we have to look beyond the U.S. Um, I mean, even if, if most of my research has been on the nation of Islam most recently, but even there are many entry points of the nation of Islam into um, the, Car the Caribbean and in, in um, Europe. So I think it's really important, even to look at, even to identify the uniqueness of the American context. So even to give more insight on our context is worth doing those comparative studies. Well, let me let me ask you about that because um, since we're in 
Black History Month. Do you think there is a particular importance to US Muslims who are not African Americans to study that they, that in particular, Muslims in, a, in, a, in the United States who, who do not trace their lineage to Africa or to black history to study the history of African American yeah. Islam in this country? And, yes. And, and why? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one, everyone needs to study uh, that history. The, the, the African American piece, the black history yeah. piece, and also, right, the Islam as it relates to black history piece, right? But um, that, could, that should be required reading knowledge for everyone, just because of the way in which, well, first of all, the way, as we know, that this, this country was built yeah. on the, the, the toil of black people, right, and the sweat and the pain of black people. Um, but also, we need to know about it in the ways that we continue to sustain racial inequality in this country. Including All, among Muslims? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Even right. including among black people, probably. But, but certainly, um, the ways in which, um, absolutely the way, and that, that's what my second book, my first book, I'm sorry, is about, is looking at the ways, one, that racism is, a, um, it is it is a disease. It is a problem that pervades, that permeates throughout our society. Our society, right? Ours is a racialized landscape. So that then means that the ummah, the American and the American ummah, the American Muslim community, kind of superimposed on that landscape, is also going to be impacted by racism. So that's part of the point, right? And, and so it's not even just, it's not just about, you know, these prejudices, because, you know, many of uh, South Asians who I would interview would talk about, oh, but they're even South, they, there's even prejudice among South Asians and Arabs, there's even tensions there. So I guess some ways trying to downplay my research or this, this trying to downplay this inquiry into their ill treatment of African Americans. My point was, no, that we need to look at the ways in which we are all complicit in this racial order, and particularly the ways in which immigrants are. Uh, that when, even if you're a black immigrant, when I say even black people, right, black immigrants who come mm -hmm. to this country, they too feel that in order to assimilate, in order to be successful here, mm -hmm. that uh, you must become white as much as possible because, right, they cannot become white, they, they are black, but there are other ways of access into whiteness, income, the, the neighborhoods that you live in, you live in, um, you know, your English, I get your education, I didn't say that. So, um, so it's really important for immigrants to do that and the children of immigrants and so second generation American Muslims to do that. I think also just our moral responsibility, you know, our claim to be <coughs> this, um, this ideal community, this exemplary community that the Quran talks about. So how are we living up to that? You know, how are we living up to these values of brotherhood, sisterhood? So for those reasons, too, that it's, it's very important. And then also, um, it's important because we are now, Muslims are now the targets of racism via Islamophobia. So, you know, it's critical for us to learn about the experiences and the strategies of the communities before us. And I guess when I say it, I'm not, and I'm not speaking from the perspective of immigrants and second generation Americans, but it's important to know that history. But to know, and, and to, in, in other words, learn from black protests. But you must do it in a way, in a genuine way, in a, in a sisterly way, um, that you're actually forming relationships with African American Muslims. That it's not that you're you're learning about. Um, black protests, and you're learning um, these strategies of the civil rights movement, not simply for the sake of, of Muslims so that, you know, we can fight Islamophobia, but you have to form these genuine ties with African American Muslim communities, I think, to do it most effectively. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's time for comments and questions from you all. Um, is there any particular way in which, shall we just start calling you know, on um, folks? I have the, a short um, rule uh, for yes, the Q&A please. section, which this comes out of uh, a lifetime of squirming 
in academic conferences. Um, th there's something uh, addictive and erotic about uh, the proverbial microphone. And uh, for many people, once they start hearing their own voice, the temptation <laughs> to just pontificate out loud. And I will say there is a gender Leopold nature yeah. to this. Um, <laughs> the uncle, the uncle phenomenon. Um, so please ask a question. Make sure it's a question. Right? It has to be a question. It has to end in a question mark. This is not a sermon, and it's not your sermon. You're here to ask a question. Have it be short and concise. Um, 30 seconds is great. Um, if you talk for more than a minute, it's really not a question. It's a, it's a khutbah. Uh, a sermon. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, with that, I would just like to kind of uh, open it up. I just had a quick, just to extend on what you were saying about Islamophobia, the intersectional nature, nature of it. How does it affect the black Muslim community? Because I feel like because of the history, what does the conversation look like for a community that already understands and has processed marginalization versus an Arab American who sort of passed as white and then suddenly realizes, I can't pass as white anymore? Right, yeah. I think there are different conversations going on. You know, one is that we're, one is that we're not uh, as alarmed by it or shocked by it. Also, for instance, like the, the comments that Donald Trump made, right? That you know, part of the black experience is all is having to always face um, the, these racial, the, the bigotry and these uh, racial slurs. And so, so in that sense, you know, it's not that surprising, right? So I, I think that's one way that people have talked about. But another way is people have talked about now. We kind of have this um, this triple oppression. Well, I'm, I'm thinking women, particularly. Mm -hmm. A lot of Black women writers have talked about this. So, uh, so the the oppression of being a woman, of being a Black, and now being and being Muslim. So, so you know, you do find many who uh, are filling this the layers of this identity, and 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 then others less so, right? Um, and I think another conversation is, I mean, this happened after 9-11, too, is um, African Americans talking about, you know, one, one feeling, um, one recognizing the blessing of uh, leadership like Imam Wafi Muhammad, for instance, you know, um, African American Muslim leaders, and particularly Imam Wafi Muhammad, who recognized how crucial it was for us to maintain our, and maintain our American identity even as we are Muslim, as we live as Muslims. And so, so for many African American Muslims looking at this Islamophobia and the way that immigrants were targeted, there was this conversation of, okay, now see, one, you know, our, our community, our leadership, which has been criticized, now people are recognizing um, the wisdom in that leadership. And then, but then others are going so far as to say a little bit more critical as some African Americans saying, well, now, um, you know, immigrants are getting what they deserve for um, not uh, uh, understanding, sympathizing with the racial profiling that black people have been enduring for centuries, right? So, so there, there's, a, there's a mix of conversations that have been going on, which I think for the most part, there have been healthy engagement between the two communities. Figuring out, um, you know, how to collectively, ideally, this is ideal to collectively battle against Islamophobia. I uh, and I would add that um, my own uh, view of Islamophobia is that it's not merely a popular phenomenon, but is state produced and has been um, since the 1930s uh, in terms of the FBI's uh, uh, both surveillance, uh, but also a study of um, Islam. Uh, and, um, and, and you'd be, su you'd be shocked if you read the, the files of, at, at how many monographs about Islam were produced and such. And um, of course the government has also, uh, through its uh, defense funding after World War II, sort of tried to favor certain forms, oftentimes Sufi-oriented, personalistic forms of piety, over um, those forms of Islam, including Sufi forms of Islam, which uh, emphasize social justice. 
African Americans, of course, until uh, the Iranian Revolution, were overwhelmingly the targets of government uh, prosecution um, when it came, when it comes to uh, this kind of thing. Today, um, what has happened in part is that um, people who oftentimes are in the Debbie D. Muhammad community are seen as uh, patriots and potential bulwarks in, in, uh, in, in state-directed Islamophobia against challengers to Salafi, Wahhabi, Tablighi, Jama'at. I don't have time to explain what all these terms mean. They may not mean what some of you think they mean automatically, but let us say that non-WD Muhammad uh, forms of, uh, of Islam that are popular in various African American communities. And so uh, government resources have been very much directed at cracking down on certain forms of African American Islam, and um, there's been a, a concomitant popular sort of um, fascination uh, in the Showtime series with seeing African American Muslims as potential saviors, as indeed the Americans who can bring back the lost sheep, both among black people but also the immigrants, and, 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 and catch the bad apples who are anti-American and then lead those who are not, you know, uh, who, who are not properly practicing Islam, Islam, which as we know is a pro-American religion. Uh, according to the FBI in its best form and Presidents Obama and Bush. Um, and so, uh, you know, so that I see the mechanisms of the state uh, deeply impacting, favoring certain forms and communities of African American Muslims over others, and thus increasing Islamophobia of, for example, a black woman who chooses to wear the burqa who then is deep, who's seen as deeply uh, frightening and a potential sign that black people are going over to the dark side. Okay, Whoever, I don't know who was first. <laughs> I don't know, you said just questions. Okay. No, I just wanted to say thank you. I, I felt that, you know, both to you and to you all, I felt that this was very poignant and very important to talk about, especially in this space at Duke. Um, I do the cultural competency Competency trainings for my office, and have had within the last two weeks two experiences where, in one space, the people in the training had no idea that African Americans make up the majority of Muslims in this country, and were blown away by that fact and figure. And on the other hand, went to another training um, where there was an emphasis on the black church as a pillar of the black community, and no emphasis on the nation mm -hmm. or uh, Islam and black Muslims of being a similar pillar that holds up this house. Um, and when I brought that up, they didn't have enough uh, knowledge or know how to like explain how the nation has given personhood to black people that weren't considered human, you know, in this country up until a point, and how the nation provided that. And so it was just so interesting that the church and black churchhood and black, um, you know, that black church theology is so pushed and so evident in all of these talks. And then when I ask about like, but what about the nation as being, you know, black? you know, religion and black personhood, no one had any answer well, and yeah. yeah. I'm I'm glad you brought that up because that is another dynamic we didn't really talk about is the way that the black church saw the nation of Islam as competition. Some. Some, thank you. It was Some. a it was a it, it turns out it was a far more diverse story than what has been told. Mm -hmm. Because remember Malcolm X oftentimes would mount the pulpit in a black church. Mm -hmm. Because there were plenty of I mean this is some just remember, again, reading the FBI files about black religion and all about this stuff, there were plenty of Christian ministers who were seen as, through their pro-Japanese sympathies in the 1930s. Uh, Jamil's over there, so I gotta give him a little, a little shout out to Japan there. He's not Japanese, by the way. Uh, and um, this sort of, you know, and so really from, that, that's what, and you gotta remember for the Garvey movement, how many Christian ministers were also Garveyites? So the idea, now it's good, it's a good selling point on the part of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X that the church is sort of, I mean they helped us think about the church as quietistic. And there were quietistic churches, but there were also always activist churches and it was far more diverse. And I'd say also that, that to, to ignore African American civil society that is not religious is also repeating a fundamental form of racism because it, 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 pitting black people is like essentially 
you know, religious, that they're more religious than white people. Because when we look at African American civil society, we have got to talk about the Masons, the Prince Hall Masons, we got to talk about the Shriners, we got to talk about the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, we got to talk about other labor unions, we got to talk about musical uh, organizations, artistic organizations. Black culture is indeed more than religion, even if uh, W.E.B. Du Bois said that the black church was a nation within a nation. But, I, mm. but, but go on. <laughs> Sorry that I interrupted. No, no, no. I, 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 was, just I was just raising that. No, no, it was, I was just raising that as another point, but you definitely talked about the complexity of it. That there's just not one story again, right? Again, but you were just, and these other labor movements or, and other organizations, again, you were adding to, you were educating us on the fullness of that history that has not been fully told. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So who was, I think, who I was used next? To, we're not, we're uh, not keeping track of who's next. Sorry. Um, so I guess my question would be what about uh, prisoners' rights? Because if we're going to talk about, the question of what it means to be human and think about the ways in which um, black history and the question of Islam sort of figure into that question. Um, I think it would be very important to think about how we uh, we can judge a society, might, one might argue, uh, based on how it treats its incarcerated population. And our sort of contemporary conceptions of uh, prisoners' rights can be very much um, linked to the organizing efforts of black Muslim prisoners, historically. That's and so great. I think I, I just wanted to sort of insert that. Uh, maybe we can sort of mull over that a little bit as well. Yeah. And so the question The is, question would be, if you could, I mean, based on you know whatever um, uh, information you might have, sort of think about that more um, uh, as far as this discussion. Um, I think that might stand as a prime example of uh, the importance of thinking about black Muslim history mm -hmm. um, as a sort of um, a, an important point to think about with regard to uh, wider publics um, yes. and its importance. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't have much to say about it, but I'm glad you raised it. And I, it just points to another source that I think is very useful, and that's um, the Black Pilgrimage to Islam. And I, there's a chapter that he uh, devotes to Muslim prisoners, uh, which I, I think is a very great piece. It, I mean, his whole book is, is ethnographic or anthropological, so it's very rich with detail and, uh, and the yeah, it provides- spirit, right. right, spirit's written something. And then, uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, so, El uh, Multag, or something, I think. She, Kathy Moore gave it an Arabic title, I'm not sure why, but uh, it's all about uh, the law and Muslims. And she has, she, she makes the point, and it's been echoed uh, by a recent book whose name I'm, I'm just forgetting but can get to you, um, that has made the case exactly that, that African American Muslims, including both Moors and members of the Nation of Islam, have been um, absolutely uh, are the most important. Understanding their cases is uh, is is the essential piece in understanding modern prisoners' rights of religious practice. They are the precedent-setting cases. Like uh, I think Brown versus again, I can't tell you all of them, but 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 I but I can send I can send you the cases. So it's it's that's the case law on which. All that all prisoners rely on in order to make their cases now that they have the right to practice religion. Those were that really changed American prisons. That were then legislated. It's a complicated legal history that I don't have uh, too much time to get into. But then uh, you know that that was that the Rehnquist Court then uh, scaled back, but then was restored by the Congress in the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And so it's a kind of how much, how many rights prisoners have. And there's always been a deep, in, in the post 9 11 environment, there's, um, there's a deep worry that prisoners are incubators of radicalism. Um, and so, and that's been also, a, so how, that there's a worry among, uh, we have annual meetings, I often get 
I sometimes, not often, I sometimes get invited. They're FBI agents, prison wardens at the American Academy of Religion, and they want to all talk about the different kinds of Islam that are practiced in prisons. Uh, and they're very worried about it, very concerned. And so it's clearly a really important <coughs> issue, and I'll just finally link it to, you know, the idea of the panopticon. And I mean, for those of you who are interested in um, Michel Foucault, you know, that, that seeing the prison uh, as a primary institution of governance is indeed, is, I agree with you, is at least for Foucault, it really is one of the key components of the way in which the modern nation state operates. And seeing then how our prison systems uh, try to shape, contain uh, Muslim, uh, Muslims and Islam within it is a key to unlocking the way in which the state um, is shaping uh, not just that population, but uh, the, the limits of freedom, the limits of what it means to be free in our society. Hi, I'm, just, I'm just going to read off my question. It's for, I'd like to hear from both of you about it. Um, so how do we, how do you or how do we deal with the erasure of like black and African identity within Islamic studies by them being dismissed as either too Arab or like too conservative slash Salafi slash exclusionary? Because I know coming from Sudan, I come from a generation that has to reconcile a lot of Afro Arab identity. And often what I encounter is what I see as this very problematically purist notion of identity that like constantly tries to reach further and further and further back into history to say, oh no, this is the only way that like you can be a real African, or that you can be, or that, you know, blackness like can't be a Muslim, or Muslimness can't be fully black, which I personally find problematic, and I see it reproduced in a lot of Islamic studies now. That we'll say, for example, oh, this guy is black, but he's too Sidhi, like he's not really like representative of the community. So how would you both like, Deal with that. That's interesting though because there's a large black Salafi community. In fact, when I think of Salafis, I mean, I'm, I just, it may not be accurate, but when I think of Salafis, I think of black people, black Muslims. So, um, right here, I'm, yeah, in, in Durham and all the cities throughout the East Coast at least. Um, so, yeah, so I would say that, I would say that there's definitely a black Salafi. They're black Salafi communities, and I think those identities are coming together. I don't think people are, I don't know, I, I don't think people are questioning those identities. I don't see it in the same way as you're seeing it. Now, I don't know about the Sudanese, the Arab piece, but um, I feel that black Salafis, again, are recognized, or, or yeah, I would say they're recognized as this movement or this approach, right, within Islam. Right, or with, with, within black American Islam. Um, but I definitely see it as being critiqued. I would say, for instance, that Sherman Jackson, I, I, I think he's definitely critiquing um, that, that approach. So he's critiquing that approach. And um, certainly he's saying that, that they have kind of capitulated to immigrant Islam. So then would that also then mean that he's saying that they're not really black. I don't know if he's going that far to say that, but I think he's definitely saying that that's not. He seems to. He, he, okay, do you think so? <laughs> okay, so maybe I just wasn't reading it that way. But you, so you, you think he's saying that they're not, they're not black or they're just not? He makes they, these heuristic categories of, you know, if you're authentic, if you're true to black religion, which is a protest tradition, right. you know, uh, and, and you know that if unless you are somehow embodying that in your interpretation of Islam, and you instead you're aping the immigrant Islam, he puts immigrant Islam in capitals, capital immigrant Islam as a heuristic device. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if he. You know, he's not here, so you'll have to ask him. But uh, he's, he would seem to at least you could use his framework to to, to see it in that. Um, and it's complicated, as you point out, by issues of race, which are so. The, so, so in the um, one of the claims for him, Malcolm X constantly received criticism over the idea that you know why are you being so Arab? You know, I mean, uh, Thurgood Marshall called called them, um, the, you know, 
he, he didn't make a distinction between Muslims and Arabs, right? And so only Arabs are Muslims and only Muslims are Arab, that kind of thing. And so they said, why would you want to be an Arab? You know, you would, you know, there's a different, the Arabs invaded us. It's that whole theory, you know, the Arabs, uh, Saudi Arabia still has slaves, uh, you know, and this came up, uh, this, these kinds of tropes came up deeply in the Darfur crisis. Right, where, where uh, again, it domestic activism, suddenly it was, once again, la mission civilatrice, the civilizing mission where we have to go save the poor Darfuris because the Arabs are trying to. Now, of course, most people in America would never, if, if the Arab Sudanese appeared, they think they're just black people. They would know the difference, right? I mean, but, but for Malcolm, what his answer to this was is that he, as and people don't understand, he spent quite a lot of time in Sudan. And he kept encountering Sudanese scholars all over the Middle East, and and also black people. So he saw he saw Anwar Sadat was the vice president of Egypt, a black man. He said, "Well, hold on. If the Arabs are so racist, how does Anwar Sadat become vice president?" And then he sees the head of the Muslim World League is a black sheikh, Mohammed Sorod of Saban. He says, "Well, how 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 are the Saudis if they're so racist? How are they?" And then you know he sees Malik Badri. Who's a Sudanese? Uh, who's a Sudanese uh, professor? He has a position at the American University of Beirut, you know. And so he he doesn't he, he um, his idea is that he acknowledges that there's anti-black racism among Arab people, but he also acknowledges a kind of uh, social mobility and a, a, a possibility for liberation that was not possible in the United States at the time. So if I may, uh, just in the interest of making sure that our wonderful friends have a chance to get to dinner, um, let me uh, bring the formal portion of our evening to an end.